Very nice to see you on this sunny autumnal day. Um, my name is Zoe Fritz. I am a consultant in acute medicine in Annenbrooks, and I do research in applied clinical ethics. And I can attempt, my, my job is to attempt to weave together these three extraordinary individuals who are going to talk to you about the future of the NHS. Um, so we're going, we've got, uh, shall I talk, introduce each of you in turn or tell, tell you about all of them now? We've got Claire Stoneham, who's the Director of Strategy at Cambridge University Hospitals and was a formal civil servant, followed by Charlotte Summers, who's a Professor of Intensive Care Medicine at Adam Brooks and the Director of the Heart and Lung Research Institute. And finally, Mary Dixon-Woods, who's the Director of the Healthcare Improvement Studies Institute here at Cambridge as well. Um, they're each going to give a talk and we have left time for discussion, which we're hoping obviously will be uh, fantastic with, with this excellent audience. So over to you, Claire. I'm up first, I think. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you Zoe. I'm going to come and stand here so I've got my button. Right, hello. Lovely to see you all. Um, so I'm going to kick off. This is, this is me. Um, and I'm going to talk, I think, focusing on kind of policy and strategy from the NHS and trying to address, I think, some of the questions in the blurb for the talk about what is the future for the NHS, where are the challenges, what are some of the things we need to be thinking about. So my first slide, I wanted to start uh, by saying uh, I think the polling data shows there is a strong public support for the current uh, NHS model. And you can see here, this is a graph, uh, I think it's Ipsos Mori uh, data, particular support for uh, the NHS care being free uh, at the point of use. I think that is 78% uh, of respondents very satisfied with that. The pictures on this graph, I think then I've, I've, I've uh, so around the graph, I've, I've taken to illustrate, I think, the emotional connection, again, that people in this country, I think, have with the NHS. And you'll recognise... Uh, from uh, the COVID time, but the, uh, the dancing nurses is from the Olympics opening ceremony. So this existed uh, a long time before the pandemic. And my basic argument, I think, that I'm trying to make with this slide is I don't think there is a lot of uh, N uh, public support for making big changes to the way uh, the NHS is funded. Um, I also talk a little bit from, uh, from personal experience as well, having worked very closely with Andrew Lansley uh, when he brought forward uh, his uh, NHS Act uh, in, in, in 2010, 11 and 12. That was a very difficult time and there was not widespread support actually for a very limited uh, amount of, of reform. So that's my first, uh, my first argument. However... Um, I do think there are some very significant challenges that, that, that face the NHS, and Charlotte and Mary will talk about more uh, from, from, from their perspective. But, but one from mine is that access to care is a significant uh, and, and growing issue. And again, I've illustrated this point uh, with, again, some, some polling data, and you'll see right at the top there, 65 percent of people saying they are very or quite dissatisfied with the time it takes to get an appointment uh, with the GP or, or with a hospital. And I think this is something that we do really need to think about. Actually, if people can't access healthcare when they're sick, um, is the NHS really uh, meeting uh, the needs of the population? And what can we, what, what can we do about that? You'll obviously have, have, have heard uh, talk about access uh, to care in the context of, of COVID, and it's absolutely true that had uh, a big impact uh, on the NHS. And you can see from the graph on, what is it, your left-hand side here, basically long waits were, were not a problem uh, in, in the NHS, and then a huge increase uh, caused by uh, responding to COVID. But really, the point of this slide is the graph on the right, which is to say, actually, uh, waiting times have been deteriorating for really quite a long time uh, before, before COVID. And you can see here this sort of vertical line on the graph on the right. That was the government standard for uh, access to hospital treatment was last met in October 2015. So actually, this is not a new issue. Uh, it's been going on for, uh, for, for quite, uh, quite a long time. So I'm going on to, so what should, we, what should we do about that? If we accept that that is uh, a big challenge for the NHS, what are some of the potential solutions? And the first one I've got here is, well, we should just spend more money. Uh, that would be a good, uh, good thing to do. And I think I can see particularly where um, that argument comes from. Again, the graph on the left here shows spending uh, on the NHS, but adjusted uh, for uh, for. Uh, 
changes in the population, for demographic changes. And you can see, you know, the top line there is quite steep up. We have absolutely been spending a lot more money uh, on healthcare. But actually, if you adjust for changes in population structure, the line is much, much flatter. So uh, an increasingly uh, older population, more demand on healthcare, uh, more demand uh, on, uh, on, on resources. But my argument here over on the right-hand side is I think we've got to think really carefully about is it feasible to spend very significantly uh, increased sums uh, on health. And you can see here right at the top, uh, that is the, uh, the annual budget for the Department of Health and Social Care, £193 billion. Pounds. And what I'm showing you here is how that compares to other government departments, other areas of government spending. Um, and you can see the spending on health absolutely dwarfs uh, other areas of government spending. And I think it gets us into some really difficult questions about which other aspects of public services you would like to you know, move money from in order to, to, to spend more on health care. Um, and, and actually, even if you did that, you made some very difficult choices around, you know, funding the police, for example. You can see the Home Office there. It's only £15 billion pounds. It doesn't, it's not a huge sum of money when you compare it to actually what we already spend uh, on health. Should we invest in more capacity? So over on the left-hand side here, this is a graph of the number of uh, hospital beds in the NHS. And you can see really quite a significant decline uh, in NHS capacity over the last 30 years or so. I think there is no doubt that is one of the factors that is contributing to increased pressure uh, on, uh, on the NHS. One of the reasons I think for that is this graph on the right, which is a capital spending. Um, so the total NHS budget covers both day-to-day -day spending uh, and investment in, in infrastructure. Uh, and actually, the investment in infrastructure is proportionately very low compared to the total amount of, of spending. It was kept particularly flat uh, during the, the, the 2010s. Funding was diverted uh, from the capital budget to, to, to spend on day-to-day -day spending. And that has had an impact in terms of the amount of investment in buildings, uh, in digital, uh, in, in, in other areas. Just an just a sort of interesting side point on this. This is the total amount of money the NHS is allowed to spend on capital. Um, it is capped by the government and there is no ability for trusts to, you know, for example, raise funds from other areas other than, Mary, from uh, philanthropic donations. Um, right, what else, what else could we do? Should we recruit some more staff? You'll hear a lot uh, in the news around uh, vacancies in the NHS. What this graph shows is that actually there's been quite a significant increase in the number of staff in the hospital uh, sector uh, over the last 10, nearly 15 years or so. So yes, absolutely, there is still real pressure on those services, but there has been uh, a, big, uh, a big increase. However, if we look in primary care, so these are the, this is GP practices out in the community, Perhaps the staff group particularly charged with the sort of, you know, looking after people, you know, in their homes, in the community, people with long term conditions, the line is completely flat. So that investment in additional numbers of staff has very largely gone into hospitals and not into, uh, into primary or community care. More technology. Um, there is absolutely potential, I think, for much greater use of digital tools with, within health. Virtual wards is just one uh, example that we're working on at the moment. So using uh, wearables to monitor people's health at home, have that connected directly into the hospital so that patients can be looked after um, uh, by you know, the sort of doctors and nurses in the hospital, but they are kept at home. But my sort of... Uh, the picture on the, the right-hand side here is just the kind of check on that, which is um, this, this announcement was made by uh, Sajid Javid when he was health secretary, I think in February uh, 22, uh, was to get 90% of uh, NHS hospitals to have an electronic patient record. So at the time he made that announcement, 20% were still using entirely paper within, within the hospital. So again, 
we sort of need to be walking, I think, before, uh, before running in terms of the uh, expecting technology to have a massive transformational impact. There are some basic infrastructure requirements in some places in the NHS uh, which are not yet, uh, not yet in place. Right, I think this is nearly my final slide. Um, and this is just to say we've focused absolutely in this session today on the, on the NHS. The NHS is part of a wider system uh, and is particularly connected to social care. Uh, and, and, and that connection between health and social care, I think, is hugely important for thinking about the future of the NHS and how to make best use of, uh, of, of resources uh, as a whole. This graph on the left here shows uh, the number of patients in hospital on any given day who actually no longer have a medical need to be there. The jargon is they no longer meet the criteria to reside. That doesn't necessarily mean they're completely well, but it means they don't need to be in a hospital any longer. And you can see about, what is that, about 13,000 uh, patients on any given day are well enough to go home from hospital, but are still there. What is the reason for that? Uh, it's, it's about getting people out into social care, either at a home or, or into a, a care home or, or other placement. And again, there have been multiple. I mean, I could have put up hundreds of, of, of pictures, really, on, on the right-hand side here. There have been multiple attempts to try and reform, particularly the funding uh, for social care. As of now, as I talk today, there is no... Uh, policy solution in, in place. So the, the, the last um, attempt to do this was introduced by Rishi Sunak as Chancellor, the care levy, uh, that was suspended about a year ago and no replacement uh, has, has yet been put in place. And that is undoubtedly the case, I think, that uh, that places a strain on the NHS system as a whole. So what have I said? Uh, a not-so-radical prescription, I think. So, um, in my view, the future of the NHS is we uh, should be keeping uh, the current model of taxpayer-funded free at the point of use. We need to particularly focus on access to care. That is the issue uh, for uh, the public and, and, uh, and patients at the moment. I think there is something about more capital investment, particularly buildings, beds, digital, all those sorts of areas. And the importance, I say, and I say this, I work for Addenbrookes, but the uh, key importance of primary and social care are absolutely vital to meet the needs of the ageing population. So whatever prescription uh, we do, it is certainly not all about uh, doing more in hospital. That's what I want to say. Thank you very much. Right. <laughs> well, I'll take this with me, but I'll do a... So next is me. I am Charlotte. I'm the Professor of Intensive Care Medicine for the University. Um, and that means that in addition to my research, you will find me about half the time wandering around the intensive care unit at Addenbrooke's looking after the most sickest hospital inpatients. I thought I would start by showing this because actually how the money flows in the Department of Health and the NHS is something that is complicated. Uh, and most of us, I think it's fair to say, don't have an awareness of the detail. So this is a figure taken from the most public or most recent public set of accounts for the Department of Health and Social Care. And you can see that actually the Parliament votes for about £197 billion to go to the department. Uh, and a little bit extra comes in around prescription charges and some of the other um, low-level charges that we all pay that go into the budget too. But about 151 billion of that, give or take, and that number fluctuates from year to year, but not very, very much, goes to NHS England, with only 4.2 billion going to local authorities. Uh, and local authorities, remember, are the home of public health services in the main now, because they were moved from the NHS to local authorities. NHS England spends money uh, and a lot, 115 billion in this set on what were called clinical commissioning groups but now have a new name. Um, so integrated care systems is the latest name for them, but the amount of money spent has not changed particularly, which means that around 35 billion goes to public health, directly to primary care, NHS England administration, uh, and specialised commissioning. Uh, and that's things like transplant services or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or things that actually are commissioned across the NHS centrally rather than locally. 
Uh, and lots of that actually is changing. Even some of the specialist stuff now is moving towards a more local commissioned model. Um, I think the general summary of this slide is how the money flows across the department and the NHS is complicated. And I think it's reasonable to say, and Claire will probably have an opinion on this, almost every Secretary of State over at least the last 20 years has changed this in some way and added an arms length body or taken one away or reorganised things from adding NHS X if you're Matt Hancock to taking it away later along. We've collapsed what used to be Health Education England recently into NHS England. We've tinkered at the edges, but the pot of money hasn't really changed a whole lot. Just where it flows gets renamed and becomes ever more complicated. The biggest amount of spend, uh, as a proportion of that, is we spend it on staffing. Uh, and you will see here, actually, NHS provider staffing costs, other staff costs, other healthcare, so the private sector use, you can see. Uh, what you don't see in this graph, which comes from the King's Fund, is R&D, so innovation uh, and research, and how do we make things better? The fraction we spend, and we're going to come back to this, is so small, it's not even shown on the graph. So the total R&D spend for the entire UK on everything, be it public and private, in 2021 was 66 billion. So less than half of the entire NHS budget. It was about 2.9% of GDP. Now, there's been a lot of arguing about how much of GDP we spend on R&D, uh, and we were aiming for 2.4%, but then we changed the methodology about how we calculate it, and so actually we discovered that we've already exceeded our 2.4% target. You just change the methodology rather than the amount of money, and the answer is now 2.9%. Uh, but what you will notice in this figure is that whilst the amount of... R&D spend for business has gone up. So you can see the dotted line is with the new methodology. We have underestimated how much we spend on business-related R&D, so how much the pharmaceutical industry, or um, which is one of the bigger R&D sectors in the UK, or the tech industry are spending um, for the entire UK. The amount of public sector R&D spend with the old methodology was significantly overestimated. And even with the old um, methodology, it has been flat and probably declined over the last couple of decades. NHS net spend for R&D for the entire UK, so not just NHS England, was 1.4 billion in 2021. So less than half a percent of the NHS England or NHS um, budget was spent on R&D. Uh, and bear in mind that the figures I showed you for about money going to NHS England don't include um, the fact that it's devolved nations health budgets, so Scotland and Wales. So we really are spending a very small proportion of total health budget on R&D. So how are we going to innovate? How are we going to make things better? How are we going to save money when we are not investing in understanding how we might do that and do it better? If I contrast that figure with the fact that Alphabet, the company that owns Google, which is a very tech-heavy um, sector, they spend about 15% of their net on um, R&D. Apple, about 20%. You know, even for a non-tech organisation, we are spending a tiny fraction on innovation compared to other similar organisations. And we also need to have a think about what we're spending it on. Uh, and this slide was designed to provoke a little bit in that there was a lot of focus on tech and innovation and providing primary care and alternative models and Babylon Health was being at the forefront of that. It was very supported by the NHS and said, this is the future. However, in the last few weeks, Babylon Health has gone bust. It was a multi-billion dollar company that is now worthless. However, we spent a tiny fraction of what we invested in Babylon Health on the recovery trial, which in the pandemic you may have heard of. It was in the news. It used a repurposed medication, dexamethasone, that we have had for decades. It's generic, it costs pence, and can be used across the world. And in the first nine months after that result, which only took 100 days from the trial starting to get, we saved a million lives. So actually, investing in big, flashy, likely to be 
um, successful and make multi-billion dollar companies doesn't always have the impact on the health and the wealth of the nation that we might think. Simple, easy, low-cost things can have a tremendous impact both on health systems here and across the world. But actually, what we're talking about when we're talking about investing in R&D is we're talking about investing in people because actually R&D needs people to do it, people who understand how it works. Uh, and the Academy of Medical Sciences have probably in the UK led the way for thinking about how we might do this. So this in 2020, uh, just as the pandemic hit, was a report from them about how we can transform innovation uh, and integrate the NHS and academia. Uh, and it's got some interesting data that sort of sit alongside it, and I thought I'd talk you through some of it. So this is the slide that Claire showed about the massive increase in staffing that has been in the NHS over years. Uh, unfortunately, there are still a significant number of unfilled posts, so we've increased the number of posts, and we're spending an awful lot on temporary posts um, because agency costs are more than actual headcount, and there's about 112,000 empty posts across the NHS. Most of them are nurses, but medical um, and other professions make up contributing to that too. However, the proportion of people in the NHS whose job it is to deliver research and innovation, and this is only going as far as 2017, that staffing increase has gone up, has gone down. Uh, and not only has it gone down, if you're in general practice, the number of people whose job it is to do research, to, to find out new stuff, is less than a quarter percent of the total number of general practitioners. So how are we going to train new staff about new ways of working and work out what it is that actually works? Is starting a virtual ward really a good thing or does it increase, increase risk to the patients, which is offset, offsetting the benefits of having people out of hospital? We don't know that. And the way in which we know that is by doing research. To do research, you need skilled people to deliver. We, at the moment, have not been investing in that. In fact, we've been disinvesting. The number of academics has stayed stable at about 3,000 across the entire NHS, even with that increase in staffing. Uh, clinical academics in contribute without question to the health of the nation. This is a quote from the report, and it shows that actually patients who are treated in more research active hospitals have better clinical outcomes than patients who are treated in less research active hospitals. Uh, and that is whether they are included in a trial or not, whether they are included in the placebo group of the trial so they don't have the active intervention. If I am sick or my family are sick, I want them to be treated in a research active hospital because their chances of getting better are greater. Uh, and that holds for both acute presentations such as acute myocardial infarction, heart attacks, whether you're having cancer surgery, whether you're having a baby. All of that has been shown across a range of spectrum. Research makes clinical outcomes better. But it also contributes to the wealth of the nation. So for every one pound invested in medical research, the equivalent of 25 pence per year in perpetuity is returned to the economy. Yeah, that's a staggering amount of return. There are very few things that forever return 25, 25 pence every year regardless. Um, I think most companies would be quite proud of that. But certainly for a payer-funded healthcare system, that's pretty good. Um, in terms of actual individual hospitals, for every patient that is randomised into a commercial clinical trial, the return to the hospital is just over £9,000 per participant. So actually, research, as well as improving the health, improves the economy, so UK PLC, but also the well-being financially of individual hospitals. The financial return of that £9,000 is in addition to the pharmaceutical cost saving when we find out things don't work. So one of the things about research is that we find out what does work, so we can do that, but we also find out that interventions are not cost effective. You know, lots of people wanted to take hydroxychloroquine in the pandemic. We found out it's of no benefit whatsoever, and so we don't need to spend money on that. There's a whole host of other things that as well as doing, we need to stop doing because they don't have benefit or health economic benefit. 
the situation around clinical academics is so serious that the House of Lords Science and Technology Commission Committee had an inquiry into this earlier in the year uh, to which I was privileged to go and give evidence. They wrote to Stephen Barclay in January of this year with some recommendations I'm going to share in a minute. Uh, and interestingly, he has yet to respond to the recommendations. So it is not quite getting through as a message that something we need to do to address the R&D of the system. The things they have recommended are that we have to fix career progression, pay and pensions, because actually everybody in every sector, part of feeling valued is that you have career progression, your pay is okay, and your pensions. And just to flag here, pensions is a particular issue, and they weren't talking about for medical staff here, which is what's been in the news recently, uh, it was particularly around nursing um, and allied health professional pensions, because if you go to work for a university and you're a doctor, you can remain in the NHS pension scheme. If you are not a doctor, so you're a nurse who wants to go and take up a research role, you have to leave the NHS pension scheme and join the university sector, because no one has ever sorted out giving equity to medical and non-medical professions moving between the university sector and the NHS. Mentorship, absolutely critical to anyone thriving and learning how to do something new. There are regional inequalities in where the research capacity lies. Uh, and we are not, as service pressures get greater, safeguarding research time for NHS consultants, who are absolutely critical to ensuring the right questions are answered uh, and that that research is practical in the NHS. We need to invest in undergraduate education, uh, and we need to engage more closely with the NHS. So there are lots of things we can do that don't require a massive capital investment or even an increase in staffing, just spending differently and prioritising the money we have differently to generate a more equitable and healthier future for us all. Mary. Thanks very much indeed and I have the great privilege of le leading uh, the Healthcare Improvement Studies Institute or this institute at Cambridge and what we do is essentially use research methods to figure out how to improve quality and safety in healthcare. Put it another way, what we're interested in doing is figuring out how we can get the most out of what we have in the NHS. The reality is we have a pattern of unwarranted variations across the NHS care that's effective is not consistently given, care that is ineffective continues to be given, care is not reliably safe or, or of high quality, it's not equitable and it's not always consistent with patients' priorities or preferences. The interesting thing is that these uh, problems go back a very long way, long before the NHS to the 17th century, uh, when uh, William Petty began to study um, outcomes. Uh, he, was, he was trying to work out the size of the population in London and hit on the ingenious idea of looking at mortality bills. Um, as part of that, he discovered um, when he went to look at, uh, do the same kind of work in Paris, that the hospitals in London um, are better and uh, um, more desirable than the whole of Paris. And he pointed out particularly a hospital in Paris, Hotel Dieu, great hospital in the middle of the city, um, where we behold a horrid scene of misery. Uh, two beds are too few for the numbers admitted, and uh, above a fifth of all those who were received into this hospital die. Uh, Petty was so horrified by uh, what he saw that um, he did a comparison with uh, hospitals in London and was so horrified that he caused something of a diplomatic incident by writing to the French ambassador pointing out that there were 3,000 excess deaths in this um, hospital in Paris, who he said did not die by natural necessity, but by the evil administration of that hospital. Uh, if we move forward a few more uh, centuries, we come to an extraordinary character, James Allison Glover, who began to study uh, tonsillectomy rates in um, England in the um, in 1930s. And this very famous um, uh, paper uh, showed that there was massive variation in rates of tonsillectomy at the time. It was regarded as a sort of hygiene measure among uh, the middle classes, uh, but he pointed out that if you compared areas that appeared to be, as he called it, um, 
uh, that appeared to be uh, similarly circumstanced, he was, he was finding striking con uh, uh, contrasts. So in 1931, the operation rate in Margot was eight times that of Ramsgate, and uh, in Guildford, four times that of Rygate. So he said that there is no possible um, reason why we should have such different rates of intervention when the populations are, are largely the same. And this was not benign. There was also an eightfold variation in risk of death. And in one four-year period, more than 400 deaths following a tonsillectomy. That, that work that he did was really quite foundational in the 1930s and was, it was kind of forgotten about for a while, but was rediscovered in the 1970s um, in uh, New England at Dartmouth College, where they discovered exactly the same pattern in relation to all kinds of other procedures, not just tonsillectomy, but at the time, massive rates of hysterectomy and so on. And we're, we're unfortunately still there with um, different performance between different parts of the, the service, different outcomes, and we cannot explain this except as unwarranted variation. So if we look, for example, just at patient safety, uh, we find that while there have been some improvements in staff feeling that they can speak up, that varies. And we've seen some of the tragic outcomes of this recently. In recent years, we've seen a decline in 30-day mortality for hip fracture, and in fact, some evidence of um, an increase since the pandemic. And there were massive improvements um, made in rates of healthcare acquired infection, but unfortunately, they are now going up again. Uh, big improvements in uh, assessing people for VTE, but they're now going up again. This, this is a clot assessment, essentially. And as you will all know, maternity services con continue to be a major area of concern. So what can we do about this? Um, well, the first thing is to understand what is causing the problems. And there's a very simple way we can understand this, which was developed in the 1960s. And essentially, it says that outcomes depend on two things. One of those is structures. So you have to get the structures right. And by structures, we mean all of the kinds of things Claire and Charlotte have been talking about. Um, you've got to have the right staff. You've got to have the right facilities, the right equipment, and so on. That has to be right or nothing is right. But also, you have to have the right processes. And that is, that is the part of the NHS that has remained um, neglected, doesn't get, get a look in a lot of the time um, uh, when we're talking about um, what we need to do to improve the service. So there is absolutely no doubt that getting the structure right is vital. And when you talk to people in the service, it's, it's always things like staffing, equipment, facilities, and so on that has them tearing their hair out. But structure is not the only thing. And when we look at the variation, we cannot explain all of the variation we see by, by looking at structure. So you can have exactly the same structures in place and still have difference in outcomes. There's some excellent work from uh, the States that demonstrates this very vividly. And for example, if you look at inpatient surgery, the outcomes that you are seeing cannot be explained by different staffing levels, by different equipment and so on. The outcomes are not varying depending on structure. Um, and one of the things that is really important with surgery is that you have complications. They happen. They are, uh, they are an outcome of doing surgery. It's a highly invasive technique. One of the things you need to be able to do is detect the complications are occurring and then rescue the patient. You need to do the kinds of things Charlotte's team do every day to stabilise the patient and present them, prevent them from proceeding to a bad outcome. So what this work shows is that differences in mortality do not depend on complications. They depend on whether you fail to rescue the patient. So that's a process thing. Um, if you look at um, what are the influences on process, it is things like teamwork, communication and culture. Um, it, it, the failure to, to rescue in the elderly is sadly a very common problem. And this study suggested that you could explain about a third of the variation um, based on structure, but the rest of it is down to things like how well people are working together, um, what their processes are, do they have clear methods of detecting the patient and escalating and, and, and so on. So interpersonal and organisational dynamics are key to how we, we improve things. Now, when you look at the NHS, processing systems are absolutely crucial. Claire would tell you this every moment of every day, but they're very often under-optimised. Um, very interesting study from the States, which has never been repeated here, but is absolutely key, looked at um, hospital nursing and how often nurses are interrupted and how, how much of their time they spend on what we call operational failures. So basically things that don't work. And it, it looks like about 12% of nursing time goes on stuff that is essentially not working. 
And, uh, you know, I, I was very glad to hear Charlotte talk about uh, technology and how we haven't actually got, and Claire also mentioned, we haven't even got some of the, the basics right. So this is actually how most NHS staff approach their computer um, in the morning <laughs> because it, it often just doesn't even boot or the, the, the keys on the keyboards aren't there. They spend vast amounts of time trying to find bits of information that they need to look after the patient. Things, basic things that they require, the scans, the x-rays aren't there. They go to the cupboard to get the equipment they need to look after the patient. It's, it's bare or the bit of the thing in there is broken or it hasn't been certified. And they seem to spend an enormous amount of time looking for keys. Um, <laughs> now, we have repeated that study um, with uh, GPs. So we sat with GPs and measured what they were doing as a time and motion study, measured what they were doing every single minute during their clinical sessions. We also interviewed them and we did ethnographic work. So we were watching what they were doing and it's exactly the same problem. They spend huge amounts of their time trying to piece together bits of information that comes in fragments, often late from the hospital, um, trying to coordinate care with other people or you know, basic things like they need a tongue depressor and it's not, not in the room. So why don't we sort this out? Um, why not just get on with it? Um, well, one reason for this is actually because of the very top-down nature of the NHS means that organisations are confronted with what we call priority thickets. There are so many priorities crowding into what they're expected to do that they lose clarity and it's, it's completely overwhelming what, the, what they're expected to do. We mentioned maternity earlier. Uh, last year, there were no less than 1,500 recommendations going to maternity units on what they were supposed to do. Th nobody can cope with this. Uh, there's no sense of which is the, the priority. And many of these things come in as recommendations, not as solutions. Many of them um, require a huge amount of process design. They need work system design. They need all kinds of things to happen before you can implement them. And that, that doesn't happen. So the solution often seems to be, we'll just grow more hands. And those of us who've tried that will, will tell you it's, it's not, not the most uh, effective solution. So what we try to do in my institute is figure out, well, how do we do improvement well? One of the things we've been doing, for example, is compiling the evidence on the different approaches to improvement, many of them used in other industries, things like lean and so on. And this is a, 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 published by Cambridge University Press, Press and is completely free to, to access. And it, it's, it's it had huge interest from people interested in how we do improvement. But the question that remains too hard to answer is, does quality improvement improve quality, that, that we don't currently have an answer to that. What we do know, as Charlotte has said, is the drugs don't always work. And when you evaluate them properly, efforts to make improvements in the NHS don't always work either. And this is because something that looks like a sensible, obvious solution may not work at all, or it may have unintended consequences. One reason for this is that many improvement recommendations that come out of, say, patient safety investigations are poor quality. They're not based in evidence. They have not involved patients or staff in their design, implementation or evaluation, and consequently they, they, they go wrong. So something that's been routine in the NHS for decades is double checking of medication. So you have two nurses check the drug before it's administered. It looks as if that actually doesn't work and may have some unintended consequences. And we've been talking quite a bit about the interface with uh, social care. One of the suggestions that's often made for how you prevent people ending up in hospital in the first place is a technique called hot spotting. So basically you find the patients who are at risk, you support them in the community, and the idea is that you then prevent them from landing in, in hospital. Uh, this very large and very well done randomised co uh, controlled trial published in the New England Journal showed it doesn't work. And uh, when the same kinds of studies have been done here in the UK, looking at, say, an integrated care pathway for patients at high risk of emergency admission, very nice study found that it did not reduce healthcare utilisation. It was associated with an increase in um, elective inpatient admissions and an increase in GP workload. Similarly, using risk stratification in primary care, another very nicely done study, increased hospital emergency admissions and increased use of other NHS services. So we shouldn't assume just because something looks like a good idea, it is, and that it's going to work. We, just as Charlotte said for drugs, we have to be evaluating these things, and they very often are not as, as effective as we, we would like them to be. 
A, a common problem is emergency abdominal surgery. This happens to 22,000 patients a year. Major issues with getting those patients to the operating theatre in a timely way. And this study of trying to improve it showed that it basically there were no benefits of the improvement programme as done. So that's all somewhat sobering. Uh, the good news is we do have, we, through research, we have discovered some things that do work. One of the things that really, really works is high quality training on teamwork. That makes a huge difference. So not just teamwork, but also making sure people are highly competent in how they work together in a team to do the procedures that are needed. We can show this, not we, but the evidence is there for obstetrics, it's there for surgery, and it's there uh, for what happens in the operating room. I'm just going to finish up by talking about why we have to co-design a lot of these solutions at the right scale. And what we, what, the way an awful lot of improvement or efforts at improvement happens at the moment is through uh, top-down improvement initiatives led from the centre. And these typically just don't do that well. They, they tend to land badly um, and they, they, the, the response is often much more modest than you would hope for. And one of the reasons for that is that NHS staff don't feel that they are engaged in, in any reasonable way in deciding on changes. Less than half of staff feel, feel they're, they're involved in deciding on changes and just over half feel they're able to make the improvement happen. So big problem with top-down initiatives. But on the other hand, when we look at local improvement initiatives, they're often very small and they can lead to an awful lot of reinvention, waste and suboptimal solutions and failure to learn from other areas. We've mentioned maternity and one of the things that goes wrong with maternity is that the, the mother who's deteriorating may not be identified on, on time or rescued. Um, so one solution is to use a system, systematic way of, of monitoring the, the, the mother over time using what's called an obstetric early warning score. We have 147 of these in the NHS. And when you look at them, there is massive variation in what they consider to be normal, the thresholds and the nature of the, the required response. They don't even agree on what counts as a fever, for example. Um, and they don't agree on what counts as, as an abnormal respiratory rate. But more than that, having 147 of these means you've created 147 units all of doing their own thing. So that's, that's wasted effort. You've created de-standardisation. Everyone is reinventing the wheel and we're just creating waste. So what we need to do is co-design on a large scale. What we've been trying to do in this institute is do this um, using technology so we can characterise and understand the problems, but working directly with patients and staff use their fantastic expertise and wisdom to develop possible solutions and then evaluate them. We've developed um, a, an online platform called Discovery, which helps us to do this. And I'll give you one example and then I will uh, stop. Uh, we've mentioned the pandemic. And one of the things that needed to happen at the beginning of the pandemic was there were many, many established clinical processes. They had to be adapted for a COVID scenario. One of these is a situation um, where a mother has a, a big bleed, an, obst uh, an obstetric emergency known as postpartum hemorrhage, and you needed to adapt that. Everybody knows what to do, um, but what do you do when the, when the, when the person is, is COVID positive? We shot a very short video, just four minutes, showing one way you might handle this. And we knew it wasn't right, but that was exactly what we wanted. Uh, we then gathered up um, human factors experts. These are people who specialise in work system design, maternity staff and infection control staff. We asked them to look at the video and tell us what they would do to improve it. They made lots of, of really sensible suggestions. We then ran a two-stage voting exercise so we could figure out what ones they would prioritise. And uh, that was extremely successful. So we were able, after going through two rounds of this, uh, to uh, get 16 uh, recommendations that were highly actionable. We reshot the video. This has been hugely successful, 130,000 views on YouTube. It's regarded as, as a model of good practice. And it was very easy to see what you needed to do to, 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 to implement the process. It was endorsed by all of the big national bodies and societies, and best of all, um, Martin Bromley, who's a patient safety advocate, said this is a gold standard for what you need to do. So we can, we can build improved processes, but we, can, we need to do it collaboratively. We need to engage diverse and distributed expertise, including that of patients, and do it at speed and scale. And we published that as, as a methodology. So the future, I think, is not top down or bottom up. It's in the middle and it's large scale improvement. Variations in quality and safety have remained persistent and very troubling. 
top down and bottom up have a role, but also challenges. And we need lots of large scale inclusive efforts where patients and staff have a key role. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much to all three of you and thank you uh, to all of you and hopefully we will, between us, among us, make the NHS continue to thrive for the next 25 years. Um, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.